working on a, a chapbook. I remember a few years ago um, hanging out with another poet who was one of the first poets to read here and um, telling her about this idea I'd had based on this pond uh, off of Buffalo Creek in Buffalo, New York called Chevy Pond and it's sort of mythical. And she said, God, that's a great name for a book. I said, yeah, well, eventually I'll write it. This is one of the first poems that I ever wrote in that series, um, although I've been revising it. It's called Chevy Pond. It's based on a story. Uh, a lot of my poems come from stories that were told within the family, and this was one that a cousin told me, uh, and uh, it's called Chevy Pond. <clears throat> on a dare, he leapt from a steel trestle, splashed through greasy, greened pond muck, and plunged deep into coils of stiff wire, the broken springs of a waterlogged mattress ten feet down. For years, boys had tossed their dead soldiers, cans, rusted shopping carts, split mufflers, busted chairs with missing seats, buggies with bent wheels to break the boredom of their limited lives. The skinny boy whose foot became ensnared in sediment trash drowned in the still creek next to the factory where his father and his father worked until it closed shop. He died before a crowd of onlookers, his frantic bubbles slowing to a stop. When divers freed his limb and raised him, his girlfriend bit her tongue and signed the cross. <clears throat> This next one is called Whiskey Courage and is dedicated to DC. It's a person. Tonight, I want to stop you as you enter that bleak neighborhood bar and descend into the cave where your dad had his seat under a mirror stenciled Budweiser. Lights up. You face down steely eyed bar flies. You, 18, with your mustache, your long hair, your leather jacket, your faded patched jeans, all wrong, wrong age, wrong clothes, wrong politics. Your voice strains over Bennett and Darren. Barkeep pretends not to hear your mixed words, half English, half Polish slang. You repeat again. Stop serving my dying dad drinks. Once I loved how you transformed boy to man, your head up as you passed your dad's cronies who mocked you for giving a damn and shot nasty cackles and dumb fucks to your back. But then I feel your cheeks flush as you grab the doorknob curses follow you down the steps, down the street, down years until you're staring down your demons in a beer bottle. You curse your lack of power, your failure to save a man who couldn't save himself, his fellow soldiers, or even his sons, the man you loved enough to bear this pain. Over and over I see you tilting at windmills, but I forgot the stacked deck. I want to hit rewind as I mull news that now you're suffering your dad's disease. You, my summer hero, my boy turned man who braved the angry bars of Kaiser Town. Hmm. Um, I don't, I think it's probably not news to anybody that most poets write about death, or a lot of poets <laughs> do, right? It's like one of the three in the triad, what is, it's like ecstasy, love, and death. Um, but I did find myself pulled back into um, a pretty intense phase of, of uh, writing about death um, when my mother had cancer. And um, 
I found sort of new ways into it um, through the work of Judith Vollmer, who um, has written a lot of very interesting books of poetry about things like Three Mile Island, and she has a real knack for pulling in industrial things. And she got me sort of obsessed with this idea of like thinking about industrial spaces. And this came from um, actually a meditation on cracks in black asphalt, which is what I called it. I rub salve into the cracked and bloody feet of my dying mother to keep her mind after morphine fails, to stave off pain that seizes her like birthing pangs, as if death is a kind of birth. Perhaps the soul swells and bursts the saline waters that hold it as her lips pull back from her gritted teeth to unleash groans. What breaks us in the end, heat, age, cold, pressure, travels thin solder of nerves that twine brain fissures, quick pulses that fire electricity, as if wire filament inside a bulb suddenly flashed blue jolts, slowed, and then came to a halt. Mm. <clears throat> Empty bed. A child asks for resurrection. A child asks. But the grown one mired in sorrow says it's done it's all done and over with once there was a fire now there is only the space where the fire spent itself in wild fury all that once mattered is now a burden cold things glass pewter Marvel. Of course, you know, it's, uh, I think it's sort of um, really easy in our age to become obsessed with death, especially if you were born like I was in the midst of the Cold War and, uh, you know, growing up with this sort of threat of nuclear death and, um, I find myself revisiting that because I think we, in fact, don't think enough about that anymore. We've kind of gotten blasé about it. And yet, it's still there. It's still out there. Um, anyway, this was another one um, that has a kind of thread of the atomic age through it, though it's not especially about that. It's called Reflections on Turnpikes and Throughways. And it includes two voices. The first voice is a grave digger. The second voice is my grandmother, um, and then the others are sort of my own recollections. I think the dead curse me. They have no peace. Sometimes we buried them two to a grave, <clears throat> laid blue babies in old graves. Traffic now thunders above their heads couldn't move them all. Gone. The house next to Grandpa's where Jackie hanged himself. Gone. Lenny, who climbed the pole and gripped high voltage wires. Twitching limbs burned white wings of angel in summer grass. I will repeat this story because you are listening. The dog died behind the stove. We dragged his body into the yard, dug the hole. After they built the throughway over that land, I started to hear him barking. How can he rest with all that noise? After school, I cut through cleared lots for I-66. Foundations persist, walls and roofs already raised. Mom digs bulbs from these lots, iris, Daffodil, lily, bare roots dangle like wires, tubers like fingers. Twelve in this photo of our garden of rescued blooms. I am the gaunt girl clutching kitten. 
Grandma knitted my Easter suit. That spring I lost all appetite. Even apples tasted of mush and gristle. Red flashes burnished limbs on my bedroom walls. When the end comes, will we know? Will sun sear our retinas? What remains? Petals of roses printed on skin. Route 66. Asphalt launches near the Pentagon. Whisks five-star generals, senators, and presidents to Shenandoah to cower in fortified caverns while we die illuminated. There is a door at the end of the hall. There is a crack under the door at the end of the hall, and the crack is a mouth or a moan. I can't move, can't twist the knob to open the door to the roar, to the roar within. Time for maybe one more? Sure. I was at a poetry uh, program last June, and we were given these odd lines to begin creating some kind of poem around. And, and the, the line that I got um, is a translation of, from a line of poetry from a Romanian poet, Grass of Your Eyes, Bitter Grass. And so that's the title of it. But I was like, wow, what do I do with this? Right? So I, I ended up kind of digging through my journal and, and sort of trying to figure it out, and a lot of this kind of came together, um, mostly by, I think this is probably a patchwork quilt. Grass of your eyes, bitter grass. I weave your bitter grass into a raft and float on the sometimes blue of your eyes. This salt of forgiveness buoys us both, but stings our open wounds. We malinger. Grief is bitter on the tongue. Heave my stone words. Can I survive their absence? We are always finding heaven and then losing it. See with fingers the shape of things, how our bodies nestle into one another, how we've learned to bend limbs and fold ourselves so we become one, we merge. Where do you end and I begin? How full this warmth of our bed in hard times. Still, I shiver at the horror of your blank gaze. Lot's wife cast one eye back and turned into a pillar of salt. Let the salt on my tongue be the cream on your tongue. I am walking thin ice on the pond between us. Mm -hmm.